Good evening and welcome to the Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's discussion is titled Suckers and Swindlers, Business Fraud in the History of American Capitalism. And I'm very pleased to have Edward Balassane from Duke University join us and uh, lead our conversation tonight on this topic. Uh, my name is Andy Mink and I'm the Vice President of Education uh, here at the National Humanities Center. Uh, tonight we are demonstrating the real um, value of long distance learning. We've got about 11 inches of snow here in Central Carolina. So I'm stuck in my home as, as Ed is down in Durham, just down the road. Uh, normally I'd also be thanking our colleague Libby Taylor, who many of you know uh, has, has helped us uh, not only organize the webinars, but is our direct primary contact with you, our audience. Uh, Libby is somewhere waiting for to deliver her third child, and so we send her best wishes. Um, but on the other direction, Karen Cave, uh, the lead researcher and writer at the uh, National Humanities Center Education team is with us in Greensboro. So uh, we've got the full team here in a long distance way, and we're very pleased that you could join us uh, either at the end of a long uh, school day or perhaps you also have had some unanticipated days off here with the, uh, the weather in the southeast. Um, tonight's webinar, as many of you know, will be a audio and PowerPoint uh, oriented um, conversation. Um, still, the chat box is really our primary um, and most important feature because it gives us access to you, your questions, your thoughts. Uh, so please take a moment to go down to the chat, which is in the lower right-hand uh, column of the navigation bar for the Go to Training Control Panel. Uh, you can introduce yourself. You can let folks know where you're from. Say hey to to people that you're at least beginning to know a little bit through these long-distance conversations. And I really do encourage you to use that as often as you can in terms of registering questions and letting us know how you feel about the material that uh, that we're sharing. National Humanities Center for 40 years has um, really supported and uh, and found ways to enhance uh, the lead scholarship in the humanities. Um, every year we have a team of a cohort of about 35 university professors who come from all over the, uh, the country to Durham and they spend their year doing their good work. They write their books, they do their research, they have their conversations. Uh, Ed was actually a fellow at the center uh, a handful of years ago and uh, we're very pleased that he's able to, to rejoin us because ultimately this is the kind of bridge that we want to create through the education work that we do. That is uh, to connect that scholarship with the world outside of the center, uh, with your classroom, with your teaching, with your curriculum design, with your instructional resources. And we encourage you to, to uh, maintain close contact with the work that we do and find uh, different ways that it can support uh, you and the work that you're doing with students every single day. Some of that may include accessing our free online materials. Uh, Karen knows these materials as well as anybody. Uh, AmericanClass.org uh, is, a, is a repository where you can access exemplar materials. Uh, we really do intend these as, as models for how to approach humanities instruction. And I think you'll find, uh, particularly in the coming uh, few months, that not only will the, the brand and sort of the access change, but we really are expanding and broadening the, the scope of what we do to extend beyond the more traditional history and literature resources into other humanities fields. And we, we definitely wanna encourage uh, that kind of interdisciplinary work and, and that reach into a variety of humanities classrooms. Uh, these webinars uh, serve as a really powerful way to hear directly from scholars and, and, to, and to probe them with the questions that you have. Um, I think at some point our outreach becomes in reach. And I think the value of tonight's session and all the sessions in our series is in fact that that, that conversation is a big part of, uh, of what we can offer. Um, you may notice as you go through our registration page that many of our sessions are selling out or our numbers are very close to selling out. I would encourage you after tonight's session to go in and check out what's happening in the spring. I know oftentimes we sign up for things early in the year and kind of lose track of them or wonder if we're going to be free or not. Uh, I think you'll find that we have some very provocative titles coming up and most of those have uh, limited capacity and a few seats available. So please take a moment to go to our our website and sign up for some of our future webinars. We also host face-to-face -face events at the Center for Teachers, and this is a chance for you to come and be a part of our physical community. Uh, as an example, uh, in July of 2018, we'll be hosting a 10-day summer institute uh, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our topic will be the contested territory of Southeast Asia, 1945 to 1975, in which we hope to contextualize uh, the American experience in the Vietnam War with a much deeper and much more nuanced understanding of Southeast Asia as a region and all of the events and the context and the, uh, the personalities that led to uh, the involvement that, that we know uh, America played. Our deadline for applications is March the 1st, so if you're interested, please get that in. 
Uh, there will be a stipend associated with your with your visit to North Carolina, and we will ask you to, to come and spend two weeks with us, which is not a bad thing to do uh, in the summertime. Finally, we really work hard to make sure that the work we do is uh, relevant and connected to the classroom. We lean heavily on our Teacher Advisory Council, 14 very talented, very dedicated educators um, who can make sure that what we have to offer can also contribute to that, uh, that classroom you'll stand in front of tomorrow. Um, I would encourage you to keep an eye on our upcoming events. We'll be soliciting applications for next year's council a little later this spring. And if you have any interest in representing your field, representing your region, and representing humanities education and classroom, I would very much encourage you to, to, uh, to join us in that. At the end of tonight's webinar, um, you will be prompted to complete a survey. And once that is completed, you'll receive a link to download your recertification um, uh, certificate. You can take the certificate to your central administration or you can put it in your teacher portfolio and that'll make sure that you document tonight's, uh, tonight's activity. I will warn you that sometimes it takes a little bit of time for that link to get to you or uh, because it's a mass generated email it might wind up in your spam box so please you know, hunt around for it if it doesn't show up immediately. Um, and if for some reason it doesn't, please email me, not Libby Taylor, uh, who hopefully will be welping, welcoming uh, her family, um, but email me and I'll make sure that we address that as quickly as we can. So tonight's session, um, you know, I think in some ways mirrors a lot of the approach that we've tried to take with our webinar series this year. And that is to say, um, not only do we want to connect scholarship and scholars with you, but we really do want to address some of the more complex topics that are on all of our minds in the world we live in. It strikes me that the real value of the humanities is that whether it's past or present, it gives us a blueprint for better understanding those connections and better navigating these complex topics. Um, all of you have a very prescribed curriculum. All of you have material and content that you have to teach. And I hope that a lot of what uh, Professor Ballasain is able to share tonight will match into that curriculum. But I also think there's the value in the extracurricular. That is to say, the conversations that you have with students uh, in the hallways, at the lunch, uh, in your lunch uh, duties, and at bus duties, um, and all those times in the margin of your day when there, there are questions and there are issues and there's vocabulary on their mind that they're just trying to understand. Sometimes this is ripped from the headlines. Sometimes it's conversations they overhear. Sometimes it's just them becoming more aware of uh, things in their life and things in their world that. Um, that, uh, that they're really curious about. And I, I think tonight's session is gonna actually offer a lot of those kinds of things. That is both a curricular connection, but also an extracurricular conversation. I'll also mention that Karen has joined us tonight because she's gonna be developing a lesson around some of the primary sources and the materials uh, that Ed's gonna walk us through. And you'll have access not only to the PowerPoint, uh, but in the coming months, you'll have access to some exemplar materials and resources that we'll be creating at the National Humanities Center. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Ed Balasane. I've really enjoyed working with Ed over the last uh, couple of years. I'm also very pleased that uh, at least at least a good bit of uh, what he's going to share tonight came from his time at the center. Um, Ed, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey, good. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, uh, Professor. And we're really anxious to to sort of walk through this. And I and I want to frame this and sort of set this up and cue you up by saying I have a feeling we're going to talk about a lot of things that we all know just the slightest bit about. And in some ways, what you'll be doing is really offering that that complexity that we all crave. So thank you for joining us. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and I'm just delighted to have the opportunity to engage with uh, with teachers from across the country. I, I noticed that extends all the way to Alaska uh, from those who've been checking in. Uh, so my task this evening is to share a little bit about my exploration uh, of, of business fraud as a key thread within the tapestry of American capitalism. Uh, so I'm going to talk a lot about the research that went in uh, and the findings that uh, that I uh, convey in, in, in the, the book uh, that came out uh, last year. But I want to I hope we'll have some time at the end also for a conversation about developing more resources for the for classroom use uh, out of this research, something that I'm very interested in uh, continuing to think about um, in, in the months uh, and, and years ahead. So uh, so let's. Uh, Let's get going here with the presentation. You trying to get it to advance, Ed? I am. Ed, Ed, Ed I'm going to be a little transparent with our audience for just a moment and give you a, a tip, and that is that 
without getting too graphic about the technology here, sometimes the uh, the go to meeting control panel is in the forefront of your mouse and you have to just make sure you're on the PowerPoint when you try to access it. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So uh, so I want to begin with with um, with this poem from 1873 and I'll, I'll let the uh, uh, the uh, participants in the webinar just ha uh, have, a, have a look at that poem, and I'll just offer a couple of comments about it. Um, you know, I think it, it really gets across the point that fraud is endemic to capitalism. Deception, uh, misrepresentation, uh, they're, they're everywhere, uh, in part because all capitalist societies are highly dependent on trust, and they also involve pervasive information asymmetries. Um, so I, I don't know if anyone has noticed the uh, uh, the author of the poem, supposedly that appeared in this newspaper, Apoth E. Carey. Uh, there there may be some observations from the teachers about what the reference is there. Uh, Apoth E. Carey, the author, this is the fictional author of this poem about uh, basically swindle, swindle being everywhere, uh, and the world is being full of of humbugs. This is a reference, of course, to patent medicine. Uh, that was uh, widely available in the, the late 19th century, uh, and that was uh, uh, it, it filled the, the marketing of patent medicine filled with uh, misrepresentations and deceptions. Uh, now, a, a key premise of my research is that the uh, uh, widespread nature of deception in the United States, uh, in, in, the, in the American marketplace, was no less true in 1823 or 1923, or 1973, or now, uh, I feel fairly confident that everyone listening this evening has had even a fairly recent experience with some uh, attempt at business fraud, whether that might be a telemarketing scam uh, or some online deception, uh, or whether it's just the corporate accounting scandal that has had an impact on, on, on one's uh, retirement account. Uh, so in in uh, working through uh, this uh, this problem of fraud in American history, um, Andy, so I'm still having a, yeah, thank you. Uh, I might just ask you to 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 advance for me because I think for some reason or another, uh, I'm having a little bit of difficulties with the uh, advanced control. No problem. Uh, so so one of the striking things about almost all historical work on business fraud is that overwhelmingly what one gets are micro histories. Uh, so these would be very, very uh, 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 detailed examinations of a specific episode or perhaps an individual fraudster. Uh, and you can understand, I think, the attraction of this approach. Uh, the, the historical experience of, of business fraud is filled with fascinating characters, compelling plot lines, great stories, that convey human ingenuity, human vulnerability, human cruelty. They're, they're really just great narratives. Uh, and, and so this is what has drawn most historians uh, uh, in, in, in writing about, in researching and writing about business fraud. And uh, actually my, my book has dozens of such accounts, uh, but, but rather than focusing on macro, on micro history, I really attempted instead to embed all those individual episodes in a, in a broader macro history. Uh, and I, I see a couple of advantages in this approach beyond the fact that actually, if you look, you'll notice that uh, P.T. Barnum and Bernard Madoff look a little bit alike. Um, and those, th those two big advantages are first being able to see some long-standing continuities. Uh, that, that really uh, um, are consistent over uh, several hundred years uh, of, of human experience, particularly about the psychology of deceit. You can't see that unless you look over the longer time frame. Um, and, and equally important, uh, that lo longer time frame gives one a perspective on changing approaches to policy uh, and the impacts of those shifts in policy. So this, these are the two really fundamental themes that uh, that I, I explore throughout the book as a whole, and I'm going to talk about uh, both of them this evening uh, before uh, eventually turning uh, to this question about where we might go in terms of classroom resources. Um, if you could advance, Andy. Uh, 
So, but before we get going, I just wanted to offer a few comments about some uh, conceptual parameters here. Um, so there, there are different ways that one can think about deception. Uh, the, the first three are really important for the work that I've done. So uh, I, I'm thinking, I'm working through the uh, experience of organizational fraud, which involves one business cheating either a supplier or a, another, uh, or a customer or investors. Uh, that includes uh, another type of fraud, control fraud, which involves uh, business executives basically taking advantage of their position to loot the company, uh, which almost always has collateral damage that's that's uh, in, uh, uh, encountered by investors and, and other counterparties. It certainly inclu includes consumer fraud, where the victim is an individual who engages with the business as a consumer. I don't. I'm not going to be talking that much about occupational fraud, which is also very important. Uh, that's what you might think of as uh, instances of embezzlement or other types uh, of, uh, of deception where people within a business defraud the business itself. So the business in this case is a victim. Um, all right, so let me, let me uh, uh, then move on uh, to discuss some of the ways in which um, fraud has turned out to be quite durable in its form. Uh, and in the experience of it. If you follow the trails of swindlers and hucksters, flim flammers over two centuries uh, of American history, you'll discover really a quite limited number of basic deceptions. So one, one is the pyramid scheme, uh, which we tend to refer to as the Ponzi scheme, uh, uh, a reference to Charles Ponzi uh, and his 1924 investment fraud uh, in Boston. Uh, but there are actually in, innumerable pr prior examples of, of what Ponzi was engaged in, which was essentially offering people fabulous returns uh, and, uh, and then meeting those returns, those promised returns, at least initially, by using uh, uh, investment coming in from new investors to pay off uh, the interest owed to, older, uh, to people who had come into the, the scheme uh, previously. So, so here there are just a couple of examples of this. Uh, the ladies deposit uh, uh, savings bank uh, scam from the, uh, the uh, 18, early 1880s. And another example, the Franklin Syndicate that operated in, uh, in Brooklyn uh, around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, similarly, there, there has been a, a tremendous amount of, and you can advance, Andy. Um, uh, a tremendous amount of, of staying power around maybe the most uh, common investment uh, uh, scam, the pump and dump, uh, uh, which involves uh, promoters creating a huge buzz about some asset. Uh, it might be uh, uh, mining stocks in the 1880s, as the lithograph discusses on the left, uh, or, uh, or it might involve uh, some newfangled electronics company. Uh, or, or internet company. Um, uh, uh, in, in the 1820s, the, the, the big focus was Western lands. Uh, in, in the 1920s, it was oil, uh, radio companies, and the automobile. Uh, more recently, we've seen this kind of thing emerge with internet firms. Uh, but the, the idea is all, has, has been consistently the same. Get, uh, take advantage of all the buzz going on in a given economic sector push a specific company, and then sell at inflated values. That's the dump uh, that comes after the pump. But by the same token, uh, and you can advance, um, by the same token, uh, we, we have uh, the, the basic dynamics of manage, managerial looting haven't changed uh, over the decades. Uh, the, the story uh, over and over again is one of executives using their control over a corporation to pad executive compensation, engage in self-dealing or insider, insider trading, uh, often uh, you know, uh, uh, advancing their, their, uh, uh, in their, scam, their schemes through falsified accounting. Uh, again and again, it's a story of smash bang, as in this cartoon from, uh, from the 18. Uh, 80s, which is a reference to the failure of Grant and Ward, um, the the financial firm that the former president Ulysses S. Grant was involved in uh, after his presidency. 
uh, and that led to his uh, led to his uh, enormous financial difficulties. But the story again is largely the same in the Florida banking frauds of the 1920s, uh, the savings and loan crises of the 1980s and 1990s, uh, over and over again. The story of Spanish Bang. Uh, you can advance. Uh, so similarly with consumer frauds, uh, the 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 basic approach is is almost always a variation on uh, the bait and switch. Uh, the bait involves luring customers in uh, with promises of a fantastic deal of some kind, uh, whether it's a, a traveling salesman in the 19th century selling uh, lightning rods to farmers, as on the left, uh, or uh, 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 a salesman in an appliance store in the 1950s peddling uh, televisions, uh, on, as on the right. Uh, in all cases, uh, the salesmen are relying on the gift of the gab. They are these are often linked as well to advertisements of one kind or another uh, that that uh, are part of the uh, lure to get people uh, in over the threshold. And once once that has happened, once the salesman has the the customer uh, face to face, then the switch occurs. Uh, it might be a written contract with different terms from what's promised orally. It might be that the advertised special uh, is not available. Uh, and, uh, and so you really should rather try this much, uh, much uh, 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 better uh, product over here that's, that, that comes at a higher price. Uh, but, but the tactic of the bait and switch, so the variations on it are endless, but the basic framework is, is uh, uh, the same uh, from decade to decade to decade. Ed, uh, if you don't mind, let me interrupt briefly and just ask you a quick question about this. And it's it's really fascinating to you know to start with the premise that fraud is endemic to capitalism. Uh, that it's that that if trust is sort of the foundation of the way that we interact with each other uh, in in this way, that fraud is is can only be a part of that. And I, I'm curious, you know, as you describe these tactics and these strategies and you know these these sort of um, these similar schemes that happen over time. Is this just intuition? Are people are are the are the uh, are the victims and the purveyors just kind of naturally falling into this, or is there some? And I hate to, I'm using this phrase very colloquially, but is there some playbook for how to do this? Is this being taught to uh, to, to people in the business world, or is it just something you kind of figure out and it's just part of human nature? So there's a lot of trial and error, I think. Uh, but as as uh, the recognition of the depth of deception in the marketplace uh, gets greater and greater, even in the mid 19th century, people start writing uh, books and publishing uh, newspaper and, and magazine articles that discuss the, the kinds of tactics you should be on the lookout for as a consumer or an investor. Uh, and the amazing thing about those, uh, those writings is that they are how-to guides Exactly. <laughs> as much as they are uh, mechanisms for people to protect themselves as consumers or investors. So, so there's a, 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 a very close connection between the efforts to protect people against fraud and the creation of roadmaps for businesses who wish to indulge in misrepresentation. Yes, thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, you know, and one of the things that people learn, and of course, partly this is just getting a, 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 a sort of a rule of set of rules of thumb about human psychology, is is that there are particular kinds of stories that you can tell that that make for a particularly effective uh, 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 effort at misrepresentation or deception. Uh, some of that involves uh, the gift of the gab and just making personal connections with uh, the individual to whom you're trying to sell. Um, but often it, it involved as well uh, acts of, of really particularly compelling mimicry, of making your business look like a, a legitimate one in order to build trust. You can see this again and again. So here's an example from, uh, from 1878. It's a, a promotional brochure for uh, people who will do uh, stock trades for you at a distance. Uh, by mail, and what's what's quite interesting about this image, uh, a couple of things that I've highlighted. First, the claim that it's of long-standing duration, established 1850. That should give you trust. 
And then its location, where is it? It's on Wall Street at the center of American finance. And not only that, if you look at the two buildings, the Baxter and Company building is bigger even than the stock exchange. These are all cues that, that are, are, have been carefully chosen to, to, facilitate, uh, to facilitate a sense of trust. Uh, now, one, one point I want to stress here, and of course, this was not something that, that people in the uh, 1870s recognized in any kind of formal way, but, but many of the, the types of, of, um, of uh, misrepresentations that I've just described, they, they actually map very nicely onto the findings of behavioral economists and cognitive psychologists over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, so that, that the, the kinds of emotional vulnerabilities that people have and the slippages in their, in their reasoning uh, are things that the most effective frauds uh, prey on quite effectively. Uh, you can advance. So uh, another really crucial theme for me, uh, again, in this uh, realm of persistence around uh, the experience of business fraud in the United States, is the way that fraud has tended, uh, particularly investment fraud, has tended to cluster on the frontiers of innovation. Here, there are a couple of, of examples of this from the early 20th century, the Pan Motor Company that took advantage of the incredible fascination with the automobile, and the C.C. Julian Oil and Royalties Company, which took advantage of uh, the boom in, uh, in petroleum uh, uh, that occurred in Southern California in, in, in the early decades of the 20th century. The thing about these uh, frontiers of innovation is that they generate enormous enthusiasm. It becomes clear to people that in these new economic vistas, there are plenty of companies that are going to make just huge profit. But there's also remarkable uncertainty about exactly which companies are going to win out, which business uh, strategies are going to turn out to be uh, the most effective, uh, which oil wells are gonna actually uh, hit gushers instead of uh, nothing. Uh, and there also tends to be really huge, particularly big gaps in information between buyers and sellers in, in these domains of, of information. Uh, you, you, I'm sure most of the people on the webinar have been reading about uh, cryptocurrencies of late. This is another prime example. Uh, Lots of fascination with cryptocurrencies, huge run-up in values. Also, lots of examples of completely fraudulent uh, enterprises taking advantage of all the hype. Yeah, a couple of our teachers um, did comment on that in the chat box and made that connection with Bitcoin pretty quickly. Uh, now, uh, you know, another key element here uh, that that I think is important to keep one's eye on is that these types of contexts are also ones where it's really difficult often to distinguish between enthusiastic puffery and uh, on the one or or just misfortune the company that attempts to get in on a great idea and is just not effective in doing so and ends up bankrupt on the one hand and the company that's engaged uh, in intentional deceit making making that distinction has never been easy um, so, so that's a, a, a really quick overview of some of the continuities with American, the history of American business fraud. Now let me turn uh, my attention to uh, some very powerful uh, examples of change over time. Uh, and what I, what I want to uh, particularly focus on here is uh, the way in which the long view, looking at developments over not just uh, a 10 or 20 year era, but rather a, a good couple of centuries, uh, allows you better to see uh, shifts in, in regimes of policy. Uh, and by that, I mean um, the, very, the, the way that different policies connect to one another and create larger frameworks of policy. And then the way that uh, those frameworks tend to drive responses by the business community, by other interest groups, even by perpetrators of fraud in this case, uh, uh, all of which uh, then tends uh, to drive uh, proposals uh, for reform, critiques of the way the current system is operating, concerns about what the impacts of policies are on, on economic life. Uh, and, and then that tends to drive the 
pro proposals for new kinds of laws, new kinds of regulatory powers, new techniques of governance. Uh, and once those are adopted and implemented, you tend to get a reconfigured business environment uh, and then the process uh, just uh, begins to unfold again. So what you get with, with this uh, long view of, of examining a couple of, of centuries of American history uh, with this theme is, is the capacity to see this multi-generational process uh, in motion. The emergence of policy uh, frameworks, their displacement, uh, the, the, the ways uh, as well in which uh, one sees particular cluster of institutional arrangements come into to being in, in, in particular eras and then how those evolve and sometimes fall apart. So, so let's let's now turn uh, to uh, what the situation was like in the in the 19th century uh, when when my analysis in the book begins. And uh, what, what I want to stress here is that throughout much of the 19th century, what one really had in the United States was a, a, def, a, a situation of de facto caveat emptor. Uh, so uh, caveat emptor, of course, being the Latin uh, aphorism, let the buyer beware. Uh, there were many, many anti-fraud laws on the books in the 19th century, but it was very, very difficult uh, to bring those laws to life. Uh, Anyone who wanted to bring a civil fraud action or, or wanted to charge someone with a, uh, the crime of having committed uh, business fraud faced really daunting legal gauntlets. Uh, the most important of which was that they had to prove intent. They had to demonstrate that the individual who had, not, not only that their counterparty had lied, but they had deceived them intentionally. And that often proved very difficult to do. It also was the case with consumer fraud that the stakes were often very low. Uh, so if you if you had been uh, cheated in a retail store, the cost, the, the amount at issue was so small that it really didn't usually uh, make any sense to, to, to turn to the law. Uh, and equally important, uh, in this era, uh, anyone who brought a fraud claim into court often confronted skeptical judges and juries who presumed that people should be able to look out for themselves. Uh, so uh, let's have a look at a quote from P.T. Barnum that describes this world. So, so here's Barnum in, from his first autobiography, talking about his experience as a, uh, a, a young boy working in a rural store in Connecticut. Uh, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read just the bottom part. Each party expected to be cheated if it were possible. Our eyes and not our ears had to be our masters. We must believe little that we saw and less that we heard. Uh, now, what I want to stress here is that there was a policy rationale for having this basic framework in place. It gave leeway to firms to engage in puffing or exaggeration. Uh, it allowed for uh, a, a sort of greasing of risk taking and people allowing people to try out new ideas. It also had behind it a set of uh, of of uh, ideas about the best way to pre prevent deception in the marketplace. And and here and, the, and Barnum uh, subscribed to this view quite quite strongly. Uh, there was a notion that that people should be educated in the school of, of not just hard knocks, but also wily ruses. That it would toughen people up. It would get them to be able to, to navigate the economy. They would learn that they should uh, believe little that they saw and less that they heard. Uh, and that this was actually consistent with presumptions about manliness and citizenship in the 19th century. That that uh, the heads of households and voters should be able to look out for themselves, whether at the ballot box or, or, or in the rural store. Uh, there was also another presumption that I want to stress here, uh, which was that economic actors had ready access to relevant information, that they could look at a fabric and tell whether it was uh, reasonably high quality or reasonably low quality or not, um, that they could look at cotton or look at silk or look at linen and, and be able to, to figure out what, what the, 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 the nature of the good before them was. Uh, you can advance, Andy. Uh, now, this world 
had pretty profound implications for business culture. It meant that there were uh, some pretty powerful incentives for for businesses to protect themselves in their advertising, as with the case of this late 19th century soup company, who was uh, warning their customers uh, uh, not to uh, not to uh, 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 look out for the uh, the efforts of a few cheap grocers uh, to offer an inferior article under the name of French soups. Don't be humbugged. Look out for the the the, the markers of the the legitimate article. Uh, another example, uh, you can advance. Another example here uh, is the way in which uh, so much uncertainty in the marketplace created strong demand for entirely new types of business services. The 19th century is when Americans uh, developed the business of credit reporting so they could, uh, so that, that uh, retailers could, and uh, particularly manufacturers and, and wholesalers, uh, could learn more information about the the firms that wanted to buy their goods on credit. Uh, this is the the same uh, period in which one gets the development of the accounting profession, uh, which is providing better information to investors about the status of of corporations they might want to invest in. Um, so uh, so so these are uh, these are some some. Uh, elements of how the de facto caveat emptor policy framework uh, drove changes in the business environment. You can advance, Andy. Uh, it drives as well uh, very strong demand for uh, information about the economy. Uh, so a whole host of trade journals uh, 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 emerge in the, in the 19th century. And almost all of them have a section devoted to coverage of frauds and humbugs. That's the phrase that, that uh, editors use to describe, um, to describe their, uh, what, what they were providing. And here, what's, what's striking about this is it's, uh, this is just an ad uh, of a, for a new journal, Electricity, that's been placed in a different trade journal. Uh, and and the, the, the big uh, reason that the, uh, that the editor, that the publisher of the new journal thinks will drive uh, sub subscriptions is this recognition that in this new domain of electricity, there's so much uh, uncertainty about what's happening and there's such wide gaps in knowledge between uh, uh, manufacturers and, and would-be uh, consumers of various sorts uh, that, there, that there, there really needs to be a regular provision of intelligence about, about all the frauds going on in the electricity marketplace. Uh, you can advance. Now, um, for all of these market-based responses to deception as a problem, uh, you know, they all had one very significant shortcoming. And that's, uh, could you trust the person who uh, was insisting in their ad uh, that they were looking out for all the, the frauds and were going to protect you from them? Could you trust the accountant who said that the uh, the corporation's uh, 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 accounts were on the up and up, and that the the company was profitable? Could you trust uh, the, the credit report? All of all of these things were themselves potentially subject to uh, to deception and misrepresentation. Uh, here you have the example of a, a firm trying to warn other. Uh, consumers about all the uh, the patent me patent medicine quackery going on in the around the turn of the 20th century, uh, and yet if you read down with the ad, you learn pretty quickly that they are themselves uh, hawking a patent medicine which is supposedly going to cure anyone of anything. <laughs> uh, you can advance, Andy. Um, and and similarly uh, as as uh, people get more sophisticated about avoiding the problem of fraud. Uh, those who were, would perpetrate deception got more and more sophisticated about how to uh, how to accomplish that. And one one example of this is the the emergence of the sucker list. Uh, so uh, basically, what this in, entailed uh, by the 1880s 1890s, uh, individuals who were engaged in fraudulent promotions of one kind or another. Um, 
or who were selling uh, uh, fake goods uh, through the mail would keep lists of the individuals who actually responded positively to them. And then they would sell those lists to other promoters. Uh, of course, what almost immediately then also ensued were fraudulent suckers lists. Like, how did you know? If you're buying a sucker list, how do you know that it's actually filled with suckers as opposed to just random names? Uh, so uh, part the point here is that uh, purely market-based efforts to, to respond to the problem of deception had some significant limitations. Uh, you can advance. Uh, and and uh, partly for that reason, and even more importantly, because of the shifting nature of the economy, uh, by the late 19th and early 20th century, one begins to see a growing set of anti-fraud initiatives that are creating new kinds of institutional responses, often relying on uh, state power. Almost always, uh, these, these endeavors uh, had uh, were being pushed in part by businesses in a given sector of the economy who felt like they were being actually hurt by the uh, degree to which misrepresentation and deception were now uh, occurring in their marketplace, uh, and that th that was undercutting uh, consumer confidence and consumer demand for their goods and services. Uh, but almost always as well, there were there were uh, the coalition for some type of new anti-fraud endeavor included uh, technocrats of one kind or another, uh, sometimes actually scientists who uh, similarly uh, saw a, poten a potential strategy for how to uh, improve uh, the uh, dynamics in the marketplace. Uh, you can you can advance. So one example here. Let me give you a few examples. Um, one. Uh, uh, and perhaps the, the most important early one occurred in uh, rural uh, at, the, at the behest of the largest number of uh, business owners of any sector in the United States in the 19th century, farmers, uh, who by the mid 19th century increasingly found themselves the victim of, uh, of fertilizer adulteration. So uh, guano, uh, you, you may know, is uh, is reference to bird droppings from uh, uh, mostly from uh, South America on the Pacific coast of, of Chile and Peru. Um, and these, uh, th this pr proved to be incredibly uh, effective uh, agricultural fertilizer. Uh, but the problem was from a farmer's perspective, how could you tell legitimate uh, bird droppings from fake bird droppings? impossible to do unless you were capable of, of undertaking very sophisticated chemical analysis. Uh, so as the, as, as the incidence of, uh, of fake guano and then fake art, uh, artificial fertilizer made from uh, uh, bone meal uh, and at, at meatpacking plants uh, grew and grew and grew, by the uh, 1860s and 70s, right across the country, one saw the emergence of a farmer chemist alliance. The farmers wanted something done. Uh, the uh, emerging uh, profession of chemistry offered a solution. Uh, and so what got what, what would emerged in state after state, in part uh, as a, a result of, of, of borrowing from similar uh, legislation and regulatory institutions uh, in Europe, particularly in Germany, uh, was the development of state regulatory action, legislation that created uh, official state chemists who would uh, uh, take on the role of inspecting and analyzing uh, fertilizer for sale and certifying uh, its chemical composition and its uh, legitimacy, uh, as indicated on the, uh, the uh, um, uh, advertisement actually uh, on, on the right in, in the, the PowerPoint. So this is this is actually an advertisement for John Taylor's complete fertilizer for wheat, which is emphasizing the fact that the state government has has uh, has deemed the product uh, to be worthy of of sale. Uh, you can you can advance, Andy. Before I do, I, I will say that many of our uh, participants are noting the real value of these primary sources and the uh, the examples that you're showing. It it not only shows kind of the long view of of the kinds of things that we all grapple with, but but they're really provocative um, uh, 
materials. So I, I'm curious in your own research, were these easy to find? Were they hard to find? Were they, I know we'll talk a little bit more about the overall archive, but, but, but how, how did you go about finding these examples? Uh, so a, a lot of a lot of them came up in the uh, many years of research that I uh, did in part at the National Humanities Center, going through magazines and uh, trade journals and newspapers. Um, some of them, you know, uh, came to me from other uh, historians who knew what I was uh, researching, and they had come across an image and thought I might be interested and just sent it along to me. Uh, some of them I discovered in archival collections, um, uh, particularly ones that you'll see in a few moments involving the Better Business Bureau. Uh, those I, I discovered in uh, either in uh, the Denver Public Library or the uh, Chicago Museum of History uh, in archival collections in those places. Mm. That's, that's a, thank you for explaining that. And while, while we've taken a brief pause, I'd like to insert a question that uh, the Judith Batten is asking, and because we're looking at these these text-based primary sources, these advertisements, and she's wondering if the lack of education or the reading level of the general public would limit the effectiveness of these these kinds of tricks and shenanigans. Um, well, so insofar as uh, insofar as the uh, deception involves text, that would of course be the case, but often the deceptions were as much based on the visual imagery, right? The graphic illustration as as on as on the words. Um, so but but there's no question that uh, the nature of deception would be often carefully tailored to the expected consumer audience or yeah, investor. Thank audience. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to advance now. So a second example uh, of increasing public action against fraud involves a, a set of problems that emerged with the rise of, of mail order business, something that uh, existed in a minor way before the Civil War, but, but really took off after it as the result of improved postal operations, greater efficiencies, uh, and lower prices. Uh, so here, the prime mover uh, to, to do something about what quickly emerged uh, as uh, you know, just a burgeoning set of, uh, of businesses that were taking advantage of distance to defraud people by, say, promising to sell them goods through the mail and then not even uh, uh, getting the money and then not, not actually, for example, sending the goods or sending far inferior goods to what had been promised. Uh, the, prime, the prime mover for doing something about this was actually the post office itself. Uh, because its uh, it, its reputation was was threatened by the degree to which uh, firms were taking advantage of of distance to engage in deceit, uh, and so the post office lobbied very heavily to have uh, uh, legislation passed in 1872 uh, that did several things. It created mail fraud as a crime, something that the post office could actually investigate and then bring charges uh, against a, a, an individual or firm. Uh, uh, for, uh, but even more importantly, the, the legislation created uh, a new, very powerful administrative tool, the fraud order. Uh, and so the post office department, uh, if it felt like it had enough uh, evidence to uh, 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 demonstrate that a business was engaging in misrepresentation uh, through the mails, it could simply take away that 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 uh, and that business that firm's capacity to get or uh, to send or receive mail. Uh, and so what would happen in this instance is what you see here, there would be a stamp on the letter, fraudulent, return to writer, and that would just then be sent back to the uh, individual who had perhaps sent in a check or an order of some kind. Uh, and this is a very powerful message, right? You Imagine you're, you're uh, uh, the, the, the uh, individual who gets this return mail, um, uh, in New York, uh, and and this business has just been um, described as as fraudulent. It's gonna it's gonna shape your sense of the reputation of that firm uh, quite quite substantially. Uh, you can advance. Uh, now the the biggest uh, anti fraud campaign uh, before the New Deal uh, centered uh, not so much on the state as on a new non-governmental organization, the Better Business Bureaus. Uh, 
uh, which were founded in, in 1912, uh, first in Minneapolis and then spread uh, very quickly to cities all over the United States. Uh, and this was associated with a concern about uh, rampant falsehoods in print advertising. The, the businesses that were especially concerned about this development were the more reputable advertising agencies, uh, the more established retailers, especially department stores in major cities, and the, the more uh, uh, well-regarded media outlets, uh, uh, or uh, big newspapers in, in, in big cities, uh, for example, or, or national magazines. Uh, they were all uh, increasing, individuals from those uh, businesses were increasingly concerned about pervasive skepticism that had been emerging uh, about uh, about adver advertising, that you just couldn't trust it. And there's no question that they were also concerned about their own social status and standing within, within the United States. Uh, so they banded together in the hopes of, of doing something about uh, um, all this uh, lying in, in advertising. And what they came up with was a truth in advertising campaign. Now, it depended a little bit on state action. Uh, so they, they lobbied, and, and in most states, they were successfully able to get uh, uh, the passage of false advertising statutes that made it a, a misdemeanor to, uh, to lie uh, in an advertisement. Uh, and they similarly were able to get the Federal Trade Commission in its early years to focus on anti-deception work. But mostly what they did was create these better business bureaus, uh, which uh, eventually had uh, quite a bit more bureaucratic capacity than even the Federal Trade Commission. So they had big offices in cities uh, with people monitoring ads, uh, going out and visiting businesses as mystery shoppers, uh, engaging in massive efforts at public education as with this, uh, this poster uh, that was looking to uh, uh, persuade uh, individuals who had invested in war bonds during World War I not to swap, swap them out for, uh, for uh, fraudulent promotions, fraudulent stock promotions in the 1920s. You know, don't let him in, he's a wolf. Um, so, so this is uh, this is this is a, a lot of what uh, these uh, uh, better business bureaus are doing. Uh, they're targeting both consumers and investors. Uh, they're not above trying to shame businesses who they feel are engaging in in duplicitous business practices. Uh, they have close relationships with uh, print and radio and use those to cast a light on uh, businesses whose uh, operations they don't like. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how the, the efforts that at tackling fraud started to uh, 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 grow and expand in the in the uh, end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. Uh, in the advance. Uh, what, what comes next is what you might think of as a as an extension of the anti-fraud state, an elaboration of it, and uh, this has a lot to do with the impact of, uh, of the Great Depression. A lot of the developments occur in the shadow of that economic cataclysm. When uh, policymakers increasingly are concerned not just about the problem of deception or lost confidence in a specific economic sector, now they're increasingly worried about lost confidence across the entire economy. And, and that tended to drive a lot more uh, uh, policy activity on the national level, not just on the state level. Uh, so one sees that uh, with the creation of the Securities and Exchange Commission to police the financial markets, uh, the extension of more uh, power uh, in the hands of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and then later after World War II, a whole host of disclosure statutes uh, that, it, that explain why there's now uh, uh, when you go to buy a, a, a new car, you see a sticker on the window. That's that was a requirement brought in in the late 1950s in order to provide better information to consumers. It's uh, this impulse is what drives uh, truth in lending legislation uh, in the 1960s and truth in uh, packaging and labeling legislation. Uh, you can advance, Andy. Um, one, one can get a sense of, I, I like this, this image in part because it gives you a sense of the enforcement going on. And this isn't just going on in Congress, but that you have uh, regulatory agencies now whose job every day is to monitor and enforce 
monitor the marketplace, uh, uncover deceptions of one kind or another, and then enforce bring enforcement actions. So here you have uh, you know, on the same day in the same newspaper uh, enforcement actions being covered uh, by by the Wall Street Journal, uh, both by the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, and on the basis uh, uh, and the work of the Federal Trade Commission. Um, in the first case, it's a uh, it's a criminal action. In the second, it's uh, the it's a, a, an, an example of both standard setting and public education. Uh, this issuing of a of an advertising guide in the hopes of uh, of, of convincing businesses to to cut out these practices of deceptive pricing that had become uh, widespread. You can advance. Uh, and and even though there's a lot more action going on on the uh, on the the national level, there's uh, that doesn't mean that the state the states and and cities are are in, uh, engaged in companion efforts. Uh, by the 1960s, there's a rapid growth in consumer protection agencies at the state level and uh, at the city and county level. Uh, uh, an example of which here is is a, a billboard uh, put out by uh, the New York State Attorney General, um, uh, Louis Lefkowitz. Uh, uh, that was also the office that put out the uh, the, the video that I asked uh, people to watch uh, in advance of the of the of the webinar. So so uh, one thing I want to stress here is that. Uh, this pr consumer protection uh, uh, ethos, on the one hand, it has a lot of bipartisanship around it. Louis Lefkowitz was a Republican. This was not simply something that uh, that Democrats were interested in. It was uh, it was something that was advancing political careers on both sides of the aisle. Uh, can you advance, Andy? Thanks. At, um, uh, now, I, I want to make a, a comment. Uh, about the the scale of of fraud in the midst of all of this uh, action by the federal government, by the states, new laws, new new regulatory agencies. Um, it's not it's not at all the case that fraud just went away in in this era. Um, uh, the the uh, the existence of a more aggressive anti fraud state did not mean that fraud disappeared. But I did. I do think that it curbed its scale and scope. So uh, this is an example here, uh, the image of uh, of what was one of the worst frauds of the mid 20th century, committed by the Holland Furnace Company. Um, so so th this company was particularly ruthless. They would send uh, um, in, uh, salesmen to the to go door to door. They would knock on the door. They would then uh, pass themselves off as inspectors kind of implying that they were government inspectors and asked to see the furnace they'd go down uh, to, to then get a look at the furnace often in the basement they would take it apart and then they would explain that they could not put it back together again because it was dangerous and needed to be replaced and now if you're a consumer what are you to do you're being told that you're in danger of having your house uh, 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 end up on fire as in the lower Left corner here of this uh, of this advertisement, um, and and uh, in those circumstances, many people felt coerced to buying a new furnace. Now, the reason I'm I'm stressing this point is that as terrible as this fraud was, it was still constrained. Uh, the best estimates are that the the uh, losses associated with the Holland Furnace Company's activities. Put it in the low uh, tens of millions of dollars uh, in in 2000 uh, the annual costs in 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 2017 dollars. Uh, so you know not a problem, but but nothing uh, you know, but still contained. Uh, Andy, you can you can move along. Um, so so uh, let me move on to the uh, more recent period, say from the. 1970s up to the financial crisis of 2008. And here one sees after a broad expansion of regulatory authority, not just in the with respect to consumer and investor fraud, but in many other areas of, of American life, uh, a period of deregulation that began to set in. Uh, very much a response, I would argue, to the stagflation of the 1970s that created uh, slow growth and really quite high inflation and led uh, many policymakers to uh, rethink some of their economic premises. 
Uh, and they had a lot of help in doing that because conservatives had uh, been critiquing anti-fraud regulation uh, from its inception, and those critiques got stronger in the 1960s uh, as part of a more general attack on excessive government and, uh, and, and, as, uh, and on excessive curbs on business uh, that was limiting their room for maneuver, their ability to innovate, and was also increasing their costs. Uh, you can advance, Andy. So here's an example of, uh, of, of this type of argument, all encapsulated in a National Lampoon cartoon. Uh, uh, in, this is from the early 1970s, and it's, it's taking Ralph Nader, the great consumer advocate, uh, as a target, and, and the argument here uh, is that actually people can look out for themselves. They, they don't need some watchdog looking out to see whether a periodical is actually claiming to have articles that it doesn't have. Um, that no, instead, actually, we can just presume that people will either not buy the magazine or if they buy it once, they'll never buy it again. And that, and that the market dynamics of reputation uh, are, are good enough to maintain consumer protection, and that if we just get rid of all of, of the uh, anti-fraud efforts by the state, well, that'll make it easier for businesses to hold their costs down in an inflationary era. Uh, you can advance, Andy. Those types of arguments started uh, uh, finding a lot of favor in Washington, uh, and again, while mostly those arguments came from Republicans, quite a number of Democrats bought into them as well. This was pretty, I would argue, a sort of bipartisan consensus in many respects. Uh, and it resulted not so much in getting rid of agencies, actually uh, 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 terminating agencies that had an anti-fraud mission, but it meant limiting their enforcement budgets and uh, uh, putting in leaders who emphasized a light touch with, with regulation. And, and a refusal to tackle new kinds of problems that emerged uh, around deception in the marketplace, as occurred in the 1990s and even more so the 2000s with derivatives uh, and the mortgage market. Um, so so uh, in this deregulatory moment, there, there's a, a disinclination to deal with emerging problems of deception. Uh, yes. hey, can you give us some context on this image? Sorry, Andy, could you say that again? Can you give us some context on the image on the screen right now? Yes, so, so this is an image of uh, five regulatory officials in the Reagan administration. And uh, they wanted to symbolize the way in which they were going to be cutting regulations in order to free business, in order to innovate and provide value to consumers. Got it, so early 80s. Early 80s, yes. So uh, what, what this deregulatory moment uh, meant was, I want to stress not that no problems of fraud were being attended to. Uh, actually, uh, even Republicans in the 1990s and 2000s became increasingly concerned about fraud targeting the elderly, a key voting constituency for them. Uh, and uh, in the aftermath of a variety of, uh, of contracting scandals, the federal government often tightened up its oversight of reimbursement, whether for uh, 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 contracts in the defense industry or uh, reimbursements for healthcare under Medicare and Medicaid. Um, they also tightened up uh, insider trading rules uh, in this period. Uh, but at the same time, there were really quite significant new openings for deception, uh, openings taken advantage of by people like Bernard Madoff. Uh, and I'll just note here that uh, Madoff is once again uh, using the strategy of deflection uh, by associating himself with, with public rules that are su supposedly making the, the financial markets safer and, uh, and uh, more difficult to uh, take advantage of through, through uh, strategies of misrepresentation. Uh, and he walks through that door and, and is able to, to pull off uh, a multi-billion dollar financial fraud. Uh, you can move on. Uh, one really crucial point here for me has to do with the scale and scope of deceit in this deregulatory age. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's not as if fraud went away in the mid-20th century. 
uh, but you had nothing like the scale and scope of of business fraud uh, as occurred in the 80s uh, up through uh, into the 2000s. And I've I've offered a, a number of examples uh, uh, here on this slide. Um, I, I want to stress as well the the gatekeeper failure point because no matter who you're relying on uh, to uh, monitor the marketplace, uh, their their the effectiveness of their actions is only as good as their trustworthiness. And if stock analysts and ratings agencies become compromised uh, and have very powerful conflicts of interest, it's going to uh, have an impact on, on what they tell uh, investors uh, uh, and what advice they provide. Uh, you can advance, Andy. Uh, just very uh, briefly, uh, just a couple of comments about the last 10 years. Uh, you know, in, in 2011, 2012, if you'd asked me, I, I might have been inclined to say that maybe we were starting a, a new era with respect to anti-fraud uh, regulation and public policy. Um, obviously, it's a little harder to make that claim uh, with the current administration in, in place. But even before that, it was actually the signals were mixed. Uh, so the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as part of the Dodd-Frank legislation after the financial crisis, that really signaled a uh, vigorous oversight of consumer finance and an effort to really tamp down deception in, uh, in an important sector of the American economy. Uh, the CFPB has, uh, has been quite creative in developing new tools of disclosure, uh, creating standard contracts for consumers uh, and engaging in quite tough negotiations and settlements. Uh, and yet, even, even in 2010, the same, the same Congress that created uh, Dodd-Frank and the CFPB also passed the Jobs Act, uh, which had as its goal uh, reducing the costs associated with new companies that wanted to raise capital. So they wouldn't have to provide as much information and they wouldn't have to confront as much of a bureaucracy at the SEC, uh, there's almost it's it's almost a certainty that that this opening up of the uh, uh, easing the uh, the path to uh, raising money for new companies is also going to ease the path for fraudulent stock promotions. Uh, you can advance, Andy. Uh, I just want to uh, mention very briefly some implications that I see here for policymakers before we turn to some discussion about uh, uh, classroom resources. Uh, you know, so what are some of, of the key takeaways for me? One is that uh, I don't think any capitalist society can rely whole, uh, entirely on the reputational checks of the marketplace because those reputational checks themselves are subject to deception. Uh, I see. Uh, Self-regulation by entities like the Better Business Bureau uh, as, as valuable, but only partial. Uh, and it's, it's really important to recognize that the more that you want to curb fraud, uh, the more that you're gonna encounter important trade-offs. Uh, in the United States, many Americans value entrepreneurial freedom. They also value the rule of law. Both of those things uh, are tend to be in conflict with curbing fraud. Uh, you may recall that fraud order uh, on the envelope uh, uh, earlier in the in the presentation. Uh, initially, fraud orders were effective in part because they happened without notice or 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 even a hearing, uh, so that uh, the post office could act really quickly to shut down a business. Well, if, you, if you're going to do that, you're not really valuing due process very much. Uh, and by the same token, you can, you can act quickly to shut down firms that look like they're being aggressive in their promotional tactics. But if you're going to do that, you're, you're going to actually hamstring a lot of, uh, of, of entrepreneurial innovation. There's a trade-off there. I, I think the best approach that one can take is one of focusing on prevention, which means uh, uh, having really good standards about what people need to disclose uh, in the context of economic interactions uh, and creating sensible contractual defaults, like things like including uh, 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 cooling off periods so that a consumer can back out of the deal for 48 or 72 hours, especially for larger ticket items. 
Uh, and the most important thing is probably public education. Uh, if we don't have uh, if we don't inv uh, have good consumer education and good investor education, uh, we're dealing with with fraud after it happens, which is always much more difficult than before it occurs. Uh, and you put all of these points together, and what you get is a goal of of containing fraud. Uh, that's that's not only a worthy goal; it's I think an attainable one uh, in the context of a capitalist society. Uh, Andy, you can advance. So uh, with the time that we've got left, I think we've got about 20 minutes or a little less than that left. Uh, I'd like to give uh, some sense of how I'm thinking about building out resources for, for uh, teachers in high schools and community colleges uh, associated with all the research I've been uh, doing on this topic over the last many years. So the, the, the first example here is just a larger uh, image of the, the one lithograph from 1881 describing the wildcat mining swindle. And I, I guess I, I'm inclined, Andy, to pause and just see if if people have any uh, uh, comments about about this image. Well, let's take a moment then, Ed, and that, I think that's a great prompt. Um, we've had a, a really robust conversation as you've been presenting, and I, I've got a queue of questions I'd like to ask you before we're done. But I'm going to okay. ask folks to just take a moment. <clears throat> excuse me, take a moment and and look at this image. Um, I think many of our our teachers, many of our participants, are probably skilled in using a variety of approaches to analyzing primary sources. Um, and in some ways, that, that includes sort of the inference that we're trying to make from this. So uh, I'm going to invite our audience to, to register some thoughts when you look at this document. Um, and I'm going to ask you to do this from your point of view as, as opposed to your student's point of view. Uh, what, what does this tell you? What are, what are the key questions you would use to interrogate this particular document? And Ed, that'll give you a chance to pause for a moment too and catch your breath and let's see what folks have to say. Karen is asking uh, whether this document refers to a specific scandal or is it more general? So, so that's a great question. And I, my, my sense is that it's just a more general phenomenon of, of, of fraudulent stock promotions in, in the mining sector. Mm -hmm. Kimberly's right. I mean, this is a, an image that once you get the PowerPoint participants, you can blow it up and you can use it in a variety of ways. So the it's a little bit unclear, maybe, but I wonder if there's a way to uh, to look at the quadrants, to look at the visuals. Um, uh, Linda is immediately noticing that the person in the chair is human. The image in the chair is human, but the crowd are birds. In fact, they're geese. They're geese. That's right. Mike just. Uh, Mike just said that it's a kind of a flock of geese. What are they trying to get in? Yeah, so they're going in green and they're coming out plucked. <laughs> Matthew notes that he's almost godlike, sort of this uh, figure above. So, and the other thing is, everything is completely over the top. So the the nugget in the upper right corner is massive. Right. There, there are these. You know, the image below the uh, the executive, the corporate executive, is trains that are just filled with gold nuggets moving east. Um, and and so there's also there's a temporal story here too, right? It's not so. It's the the geese go in, they come out plucked, and then they end up as skeletons. And that's kind of a weird mixed metaphor. So now that you have humans again. Uh, the, the the suckers who've had their bones picked. So uh, there there are a lot of details in this picture that you could get I think students to to make sense of. But then there's also I think a a broader interpretive question, which is what is the message here for policy? Is this does this lithograph suggest that the state needs to do something or not? I, I, my sense is that that could that's the kind of question that might prompt some really interesting debate in classrooms. And much, much of what you've shared tonight, it seems, is is that friction between regulation and fraud. That's right. That's right. So so on the one hand, boy, you have all these people going in as geese and they're getting plucked. Shouldn't we be concerned about them? On the other the pitch from the company is so patently ridiculous, uh, and then the the way it's per, the way it's portrayed. You know, this is the uh, if you can zero in on the image, you'll see that it's uh, 
the Honorable Mr. Thief, who is the, you know, that's his name, <laughs> the corporate executive. Uh, and so, you know, it's the, it's the, the ambiguity and the whole uh, nature of, of interactions that lead to deception and, and, and losses from, from deception is nicely encapsulated in this image. Why, why don't we move to the next one, Andy? And, and Ed, before we do, are you, so is part of what you're suggesting in tonight's conversation, um, it is that sort of ongoing evaluation of whether policy and regulation is important to invest ourselves in to combat these kinds of fraudulent interactions or not? I mean, is it is that ultimately the choice that we're making as a as a country constantly? I think that's right. So, so there are there there's an evolution of dominant perspectives about how big a problem business fraud is and what ought to be done about it. And when you zero in on someone having their furnace taken apart, I think there are a few people, very few people, who would disagree that there needs to be some kind of uh, oversight or even punishment if that sort of fraud were to happen. On the other hand, there's a really dominant thread of reducing government regulation, and those those two things are really at odds. It seems. I think that's right. That's right. Let's go to the next uh, document. So, so this document, uh, which again will be easier if you can blow it to, to sort of work with if you blow it up. Um, the figure in the middle is is a person uh, who represents oppressed businesses. You may be able to make that out in the center. And then he's being squeezed and strangled by a snake. And the snake, the snake actually is better business bureaus. It's not the state itself. It's the better business bureaus uh, who are being likened to uh, professional snoops and gangsters. Because in essence, the, the argument here is that these organizations are engaged in their own type of shakedown. You want a good, you want, you want a fair treatment and uh, the public to be told that you're a legitimate business then you better join the Better Business Bureau so you don't get you don't get uh, 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 bad press or pressure. Um, so it's this theme of of uh, concern about due process extending not even just to the government but even a, a, a nonprofit organization. Hello. Yes, yeah, Ed. Uh, I just heard a bunch of. Heard a bunch of knocking. No, I'm sorry. Um, so, so this is this is, I think, again, another another image where it might be interesting to get students to try and figure out what's going on uh, here. Uh, and and it's coming it's coming you know from a particular organization, the National Businessmen's Protective Council, that isn't made up of people uh, from the establishment firms who are funding the Better Business Bureau. Instead, it's a much a group of much smaller scale businesses who are who are feeling put upon. Uh, a theme that has uh, revived perhaps in recent years in American politics. Do I have me to advance? Yeah. So um, with the readings that I, I, I gave uh, ask people to have a look at, uh, and also the the documentary, uh, the video that I asked people to watch. Uh, I'd I'd be curious uh, if people have any uh, comments about well, first of all, the materials themselves, and how they saw maybe differences in explanation for why there was so much activity going on around trying to combat fraud in the 1960s. Um, but also, uh, I'd be curious to get some feedback on whether these types of readings with perhaps a curated set of discussion questions uh, would be valuable to teachers if I were to put several of those together uh, onto the website that I'm working on. And in some ways, that's a, the perfect cue conversation or question, uh, Ed, because, you know, having these kinds of curated materials are exactly what teachers need. And hearing you talk about, you know, years of research is is impressive from that scholarly perspective. What these educators need is that curated collection. Um, and, and I appreciate the way that you're trying to, to structure that in that archive. So, so as I as I'm building that out, I, I guess I would I would be I would be curious to hear from uh, 
from participants about uh, reading level, amount of reading, um, uh, but, but we can get to that maybe uh, in, a, in a minute after first getting some reactions to the readings and, and uh, what they made of them directly. Yeah, and Matthew, to, uh, to address your question directly, I, I recognize you're teaching early elementary and that's a, that's a much different conversation in terms of the concepts we're talking about. But I wonder if, uh, as has been mentioned earlier in the webinar, you know, that, that sort of critical consumption of information and, and, and being able to identify um, uh, the intent and the, and the author of different things might be something that at the, even the second grade level is pretty important. You know, who's writing something and why are they doing it? So, so Andy, the the thread in these readings that I and and then in the video that I one of the things that I found particularly interesting was uh, the way in which uh, on the one hand uh, there, there's a sort of portrayal of anti fraud activity on the part of the state as being in essence just the hard work of of government officials who care about this and are looking to protect the uh, the people of the state of New York, for example, in the in the video. Um, and and also the way in which that video focuses particularly on people from middle class backgrounds and suburban settings. Um, you know, there are teachers who are defrauded, two white female teachers. Um, and and a, a sort of image of the uh, what's going on here as uh, a, f a function of good government. Uh, you get a very different picture, I think, from the readings about what's going on in uh, inner cities uh, and African-American neighborhoods um, from the, the article by Senator Magnuson and, uh, and also the articles from the Philadelphia Tribune that discuss the work of the consumer Education and Protection Association, SEPA, um, which you know really give you a, a an image of pressure from uh, uh, a, not just an interest group but a social movement uh, trying to bring questions of economic justice to the forefront and really putting pressure on public officials to uh, to do their jobs. Excellent. Uh, Ed, we just have a few more minutes, and I, I do have a queue of questions I'd like to ask sure, you. Let's, let's get um, to them. These sort of sketch back to the beginning of the presentation, so they, they're roughly in order and, and, and somewhat disconnected. But uh, here, a couple, one question that seemed to come out a lot in the chat was the comparison of the United States and what you presented tonight with other places and other times. And so uh, many of our participants noted that th these kinds of uh, buyer beware mentalities and cultures seem to be pervasive in places like Russia and China and Latin America. And at the same time, there are some places that have what feel like very almost claustrophobic regulatory systems like Singapore. Um, how, how do we stack against other places around the, around the world? So I, I think those observations uh, have, have a lot behind them. Um, certainly, I would say most of um, Western Europe uh, has a more heavily monitored and regulated feel in the consumer economy, um, uh, certainly since World War II. Um, but the, the truth of the matter is this is an, an area in which we really need a lot more research. That, that sort of comparative analysis that people are looking for, I think, is a huge opportunity uh, for uh, graduate students, say, looking for a dissertation topic or even uh, seniors looking for a senior thesis topic, because um, we, we have a lot more to learn, actually, about about the, the dynamics here in other societies. One thing that I feel pretty confident about is that the dy the psychological dynamics of of deception are unlikely to be different in different in other societies. Right. Uh, so right. does it then make it unique in the United States? Uh, is it because we have you know capitalism as a virtue? Is is are we is it difficult for us to reconcile this this fraudulent version of capitalism that you've described with the more uh, virtuous uh, way that we see it? 
I, I would say that any any society that is going to have a really strong commitment to uh, entrepreneurial innovation is likely to have a problem with deception. Yeah, thank you. Um, Matthew earlier asked uh, if you had seen the HBO movie on, on Madoff, and if so, did you find it valuable? I have not seen that movie. I do need to watch it. Okay, thanks. Um, earlier, Pam Rickman asked where class action lawsuits fell in this this timeline that you've shared. That's a great that's a great question. And the so a class action lawsuit allows similarly situated litigants, so people who have basically the same uh, claim of action, to band together and pool their resources uh, in into one into one discussion, into one into one uh, uh, legal case. And that emerged in the United States in the consumer area and investment protect, investor protection as well in the 1960s, um, as a as an expression of this greater concern for uh, for invest, consumer and investor protection, and it has had very substantial impacts, uh, though also led to uh, additional kinds of critiques, uh, with 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 many conservatives worrying about abuses associated with these lawsuits, that it just gives lawyers the opportunity, in essence, to hold businesses hostage uh, for a settlement. Great. Great. Earlier tonight, Susie Quintero, who's with us on many of our webinars, asked where philanthropy falls into this. And she almost made the suggestion, I think, that philanthropy often comes later in a, in a successful business person's life when they feel sort of guilty about some of the things you've described and they want to give back. How do you see philanthropy fitting into this, this environment you've described? Well, in two, two respects. One, there is, there is, in some cases, a dynamic of trying to launder reputation through, through uh, taking gains that some people might view as ill-gotten and redistributing them in ways that are socially beneficial. Uh, but it's also the case that philanthropy is another domain that's rife with deception. The better business bureaus spend as much time trying to police charities as they do as they do businesses across the 20th century, and with good reason. There are a lot of fake charities out there. Yeah, that makes that makes good sense. Um, one more question just came in from Paul, who asks whether, and, and I think actually I don't think this is a question of whether or not, because I think the answer is pretty clear that it is. But how do you see fraud uh, growing proportionally and even exponentially in the digital age? It is a huge problem. Every new technological platform uh, is a is is a, uh, taken advantage of uh, first and foremost uh, by by those who would deceive. The telephone brings you the boiler room to push uh, to push fraudulent investments over the telephone. The internet produces the internet stock chat room. Yep. Uh, and what we're seeing now with cryptocurrencies is only a further extension of this, uh, which, raises, which raises the question of whether those types of problems can be dealt with on anything other than an international basis. Uh, that's a really interesting point. Um, we're almost out of time, Ed, and I, I know one of the things that really caught uh, our participants' attention, and I would imagine that this is something that they could use to bridge this research and this uh, sort of adult conversation with their classrooms is the vocabulary and the slang terms that you used. Uh, a couple of them, uh, particularly humbuggery, you know, really resonated with folks. Um, what kinds of slang terms have you have you found, Ed, and what are some of your favorites? Uh, well, so there's Peter Funk, which is a, a figure who just stands in for any type of fraud, but was initially a shill at an auction uh, in the 19th century. Um, uh, there is you know, the term buffaloing, <laughs> defraud. Uh, I have a, I, I've, I've actually uh, put together a, a, quite a list of, of fraud slang on the website, Suckers and Swindlers, which, which people can uh, have a look at if they're interested in exploring that in greater depth. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. And I, I think those are the kinds of terms. And I, I'm curious, too, how some of those terms came uh, and be, it became so popular and so well used and so so much a part of our vernacular and then they're gone. Peter Funk is a completely antiquated and outdated term now. Um, it's not used past the 19 teens and I don't have a good answer as to why. Yeah, it's, it's funny to look at the linguistic side of that. Um, I wonder if we have just a minute or so left. Are there any other questions from our audience? Uh, 
you know, Jacqueline brings up the issue of identity theft. Um, how does that play into this whole fraud context? Uh, it is uh, it is a major problem. Uh, it has roots that go back into the 19th century. There were businesses that pretended to be other businesses and other in order to get credit. But the the uh, problem has expanded uh, exponentially with the with the reliance on credit cards and the ease with which people can now have their personal information hacked. And then final question from Linda. I'm going to infer a little bit of what she's asking. Ed, what's the role of the whistleblower in this? Well, the whistleblower is often indispensable, but there's no, it's not helpful to have a whistleblower if nobody hears the whistle. And, you know, Madoff had, there were, there were whistleblowers about Madoff and people ignored them. Uh, there were whistleblowers within Enron and they were ignored. Um, so if you don't have the structures in place, uh, that allow someone's knowledge to be uh, to to result in some type of appropriate action. Uh, it, it it it's not particularly helpful in preventing the worst types of business frauds. And I think this might have been uh, a session that is is both deeply unsettling and disturbing and <laughs> deeply opti optimistic in some ways. And I several of our participants commented on. It, you know, it's, it's an odd sort of feeling of relief to realize that this has been going on for a long, long time. But it also is pretty scary to see that, that this fraudulent uh, environment that we live in. Well, well, Andy, I've just really enjoyed the hour and a half and uh, would welcome any comments. I'm more than happy to take emails from participants if they have observations about the website or suggestions for what would be most useful for them. Excellent. And thank you so much for joining us tonight and leading this conversation. And I want to thank all of our participants for joining us at the end of a long school day. Again, we very much encourage you to uh, not only uh, use the, power, the PowerPoint that we've uh, that has been associated with tonight's webinar and the primary sources have been pulled out, but also that, that website, the archive that Ed has mentioned a couple of times. And I think it's going to be you know, a really powerful uh, part of the way that you can connect this with your classrooms and with your, uh, with your students. I will uh, also remind you that in the readings that we provided at the beginning of the webinar, there is a coupon uh, that allows you to have access to, to Ed's book, and you can see much more of the research and the, um, this, the, the outline that really fill in the details for much of what was shared tonight. So please be sure to take advantage of that. Um, again, thanks for joining. Uh, social media is a fantastic way to pay attention to what the National Humanities Center is offering in terms of professional development and professional support for teachers. I would encourage you to follow our Facebook and our Instagram and our Twitter accounts, and you can see uh, sort of an ongoing updated list of the different activities and experiences that we offer for you to connect with scholars like you did tonight with Ed. I'm also going to ask you to take just a moment to do the evaluation. Uh, there'll be a pop-up as soon as the session is over, and then once completed, you'll receive a link that allows you to download your certificate. Uh, the recording of tonight's session should be available within 48 hours or so. Uh, this is on our YouTube channel, and you can go back and really take some time to uh, walk through the, the full 90-minute webinar. Uh, there may also be some sections that you can pull out and share with your students, uh, particularly the secondary level. It might be uh, interesting little vignettes that you can uh, provide for, um, for your, your students to access and to consider these, this same material. Love to see you uh, next week at our next uh, webinar. Uh, we will be working with Matthew Booker from North Carolina State University and Kim Gilman, who's a teacher in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, on a emerging field of the humanities environmental history. Uh, and in particular, we're going to look at the way that the oyster uh, is uh, really illuminates and gives us good illustration of early 20th century America. So please join us for that. Please encourage those across the hall in your discipline and in your team and in your school to join us as well. We'd love to have uh, some, some folks from your science department, some folks from your interdisciplinary teams. Um, right now, we have about 10 slots left. So if you're interested in this, please come sign up and join us uh, next week. Again, I want to thank Professor Ballastain. I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, at tonight's Humanities in Class webinar. Uh, have a great school day tomorrow, and we'll see you next time uh, with the National Humanities Center. Good night.